It's such a pleasure to have you here. I've always admired your films and you make such daring, provocative, and interesting pictures as this is one of those. And I think the first thing I wanted to ask you about was the ending. When you, when you write something and, and begin it, do you know the way it's going to end? Do you know there's going to be a reconciliation or something between father and daughter? Is there something that maybe comes to you some other time? Well, endings are always difficult, and beginnings are always difficult. Um, and uh, I sometimes know where things are going to land. Um, and But I've quite often had the experience of shooting several different endings and seeing finally what works. In this instance, I knew that the pieces of the puzzle needed to come together at the end um, in a in a one-on-one -on -one way, and that the um, in a way everything was going to come to its uh, its true emotional ending when he could remember her name and say her name, Molly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, when I first wrote the script, it was called Molly, um, oh. but then the title changed. But um, it, it's 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 like all the roads lead right. to that name. Do you, do you feel it's more her story then? I mean, if you were calling it Molly at the beginning, I wonder if you were thinking of more of it's it's the daughter who is finding her father through his language or lack of language. She's holding the story, but we're in his head. So I can't say it's a single mm. point of view in that sense, but I, I thought of her as, in a way, the link, the, the translator from somebody who seems to have gone very far away somewhere in his head, and she's, in a way, bring, allowing him, bringing him back to Earth right. and finally allowing him, if you like, to come home to himself and to his reality. So in that sense, it's hers. Um, she's the carer, if you like, and care is a small word for a very big activity. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, for us to, uh, to understand what kind of space he is going into, at least in his head, and maybe more than just in his head, um, that was how the story was structured. Right. Do you make thematic discoveries as you're um, making the film or, or rehearsing the film or are you somebody who has everything really planned out in all detail before you begin it? I or is plan it and plan organic? and plan so that I can throw it away. Okay. Um, <laughs> because if because filming is really about arriving in the moment of filming but that moment is earned by enormous, vast amounts of preparation, some of which are visible in the film and some of which are invisible. I always feel it's like a kind of iceberg beneath the surface of, of density of work, some of which is visible, but you can somehow feel in it mm -hmm. anyway. Um, but unless there's openness to the moment of what happened, the reality of the individual actor and their face, mm -hmm. the reality of the weather, the reality of what life throws at you on that day, or a vehicle breaks down or something, you have to be able to go with the flow and kind of ride the tiger of the mm -hmm. film and em embrace right. what happens. Um, and that's where it kind of comes alive. And often the, 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 some of the most interesting things are, 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 so to speak, accidents. But I think one earns one's accidents. They, they become useful, the degree to which you've attempted to plan and, and think things through in advance. Right. Well, bec because you're telling three, I guess, alternate realities in the movie, does that make it difficult for you to, well, more challenging to say, well, we're going to start this story there, and then we're going to cut away to another memory that he has. I mean, it's kind of like a jigsaw puzzle. And I wonder how you determine where all the pieces go. And if during the post-production process you feel, well, this kind of works better over there than, than the way I have it now. Because there, there are different ways you can, you can tell a story. There are, and in fact, I edited this film twice. 
okay. uh, once the way I thought it was going to be, and then a second time the way I oh. discovered it needed to be. Um, but I had already done a great deal of work on structure, and the, the attempt was to try to have a feeling of parallel realities that are existing. But because of the familiar tropes in cinema about flashbacks and so on, I, I gradually accepted people were going to interpret these other lives according to how they feel they are. That their memories, or are they actually existing, or is it all in his mind, or what? Now, but for each audience member, they're going to figure that out for themselves. But also, these are all questions that people grapple with in different ways. Scientists grapple with the notion of parallel existences at the quantum physics level. Philosophers grapple with the idea of time travel and memory. Neurologists grapple with the fact that in the brain, the brain can interpret memory and, uh, and, and current reality as being identical. The, 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 the neurons fire in, the, in an identical way. So there's many, many, many ways of interpreting um, the notion of parallel thoughts or existences yeah. in the mind, and the mind works in very, very strange ways. Yeah. If you put the, if you like, reverse the searchlight and look inside the skull, what are you going to see? You're going to see associative firings and skitterings and scatterings and memories and thoughts and future gazing and so on, all coexisting mm -hmm. with this incredible complexity inside the mind. Um, and so um, the project, if you like, was, OK, when you have somebody who appears to be disappearing, going very, very far away, losing who they were, maybe they're going somewhere really interesting. When you had the first version, I guess, of the way you thought it should be, how different was that from where it had to be? It was more complicated. Okay. <laughs> so I uh, thought I need, to, I need to simplify this uh, uh, as best I can. So Were there scenes that you lost? Yes, there were a lot of scenes that I lost. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that I wanted to um, see how, just how close we could get to these two individuals with, in their struggles. So it was about searching and searching through the material, kind of excavating it almost like an archaeologist to find those moments of... Um, in the, these troubled individuals um, where we could feel for them, feel close to what they were going through. Okay. I, as I understand it, this is a very personal project for you in terms of your brother. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about I, that and the origin of what? I, I can. I'll, I'll preface it with saying I think all projects are personal. Okay. Um, but the, the job of the artist is to transpose the personal into something more universal. But if it isn't grounded in something you deeply feel and, and or have experienced, it's, it's, it, it's superficial. But yes, what happened is that my brother, my younger brother, developed um, young onset dementia, and I cared for him through the years until his death. I also, in parallel, cared for a very, very, very close friend who had multiple sclerosis, became paralyzed, couldn't speak anymore, but I became her translator, and I also organized her care. So in the process of caring for them, I experienced both the, the conflicted state that can come with when you're living a life, and I was making films through, through all this period, but also the incredible aching love you feel for somebody that you love when you watch them suffering and uh, go being badly treated maybe you know people with dementia get treated like they're not there yeah. like people with disabilities talk about this a lot you know does he take sugar that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but there's a word, you know, that is used, compassion, right? 
where when you're with somebody, you go, you, this, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but a kind of this golden thread that links you through the, the, the kind of aching, aching love for what they're, for what they're going through. And I wanted to find a way of, of honoring both the, all the millions and millions of carers in the world and people who've looked after their children or they've looked after their parents or they've looked after a sibling or a friend or whatever and all of that little rewarded and little understood process on the one hand and also to honor those that are in those states of disability but who are fully, fully human and fully, in my view, of observation of my brother and my friend, even if in some people's eyes they became less than they were, in my eyes they were magnificent human beings mm -hmm. who were having trouble communicating. How do you, how do you take the, the, the personal thing that you went through and when you have an actor like Javier Bardem who has to convey this to an audience and has not felt that that caring, may, or maybe he has, I don't know, but certainly you, you've had that experience of going through it. How do you explain to him what kind of emotional period that, that, that would be, or how does he bring something like that? Okay, out? step one is the time I spend alone writing the script, right? So in this case, several, four years. Um, and so by the time uh, the script goes into Javier Bardem's hands or Elle Fanning's hands, a great deal of that work has been done and I hope is self-evident on the page. Uh. But it's no longer, it's not, a, for example, this film is not a portrait of my brother. This character is in no way resembles my brother. He didn't but go I'm to Greece? Hmm? Did he go to Greece? Your brother. No, not no, at all. Okay. No, and and uh, no, no. so it, it's not the it's not a portrait, but it's but it's about the essence of some aspect of the experience, which is what I wanted to bring into it. Okay, so anyway, that, so he gets the script and he reads it and we talk, and then he realized that for to do this role, he needed a lot of time with me in preparation. So I went many, many times to Madrid. We spent long, long days together talking. He would ask me questions. I told him stories about my brother or about all the things I'd learned from all the specialists, the neurologists. I met all the research I'd done like crazy on the internet to try and understand what my my beloved people were going through and so on so i shared that with him he also went himself to uh to uh, meet with a neurologist um who was working with people with this particular form of dementia that's being portrayed here front frontotemporal dementia affects the frontal lobes of the brain and and in very particular way and in this instance also with aphasia where it affects speech so clinically it's all accurate mm -hmm. Um, but then we discussed a lot about this is not three people, it's the same person. And that each of us in different circumstances, environments, if we'd made other choices in our lives, would be subtly different in this way or that way, or you know, we'd be more tanned, less tanned, more fit, less fit, more emotionally inept or more emotionally fluent or whatever but something would rest essentially there. So that was his challenge, was this is all me, but life has shaped me differently, and I could have been this, or I could have lived that, or I could have lived that. Not romanticizing, it's not like mm -hmm. a wonderful life, but always a troubled individual, but, but could have been that. Now for Elle Fanning, it was a different challenge. You know, she's 21 years old. She's a California girl. She's uh, She's been in like, I don't know how many movies it is by now, very experienced with movies, but in life has lived nothing like this. What she has is the incredible capacity of rare actors to empathetically leap into the lives of others or the feet of others, you know, who've experienced something else. In other words, the imagination, the power of the imagination. And she would listen very carefully to my stories with her eyes kind of widening. And, 
And then I worked with her in the way that I do, always individually with actors, to root these experiences that were not hers in some parallel experience, some aspect of something she'd experienced in her life. So she could, she could root it authentically in a feeling, a feeling of loss in her case about something that she could apply to these situations um, with, it, I think, I incredible emotional maturity. Did, did they have many conversations together? As Not too many. Okay. The, um, they weren't verbalizers in that sense, and I d didn't put them together that much. I spent a lot of time with them individually, but what she uh, be became clear was a kind of process of adaptation about how to make it work, and in some cases to respond in the moment to things that Javier was was doing that he needed to do to make it alive for himself. So she was a great responder. Right. What was the first day of shooting? The first day of shooting was in so-called Mexico. Uh, which we was had, Spain, right? Which was Spain, actually, in Amaria. And we had three days to shoot Mexico, and then four days to shoot Greece. Um, and then came to New York, and three days to shoot New York, and then back to London to do the interior. So it was very much like that. But the first day was was Javier walking, walking along those dusty roads in in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And and to film, I guess those scenes first was because of scheduling, or you wanted to maybe begin in a softer way instead of. Some of the more scheduling, scheduling, okay. <laughs> yeah. scheduling, and logic and practicalities. Right. You know, we found you know, originally I wanted to shoot in Mexico and I wanted to shoot on a Greek island, but actually we found in Spain a place that looked like Mexico and 45 minutes down the road a place that looked like Greece. If we painted a bit of this and painted a bit of that and color code, oh, changed the helps. palette of this and changed the palette of that, and um, so, but that's you know that's filmmaking, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things you said earlier, I was asking about endings, but you said beginnings are also important. I remember in Ginger and Rosa, you started off with the bombing of Hiroshima, which was a really interesting way to, explosive way to begin that movie. And then your last film, The Party, had a gun in the door. Yeah. So, and and this one, can you explain how you determine what, what it would be in the room? Well, or What I felt was that we had 10, in the first 10 minutes, we needed to understand the, the basic situation that we were in. Um, that here's a daughter with a father, the father is clearly in a difficult state, there's a carer and so on. And then that we visit briefly the, the lives he's, he's visiting in his head. And then we get out of the door and get on with the story. So it was how to, to provide that, in a way, information, launch ourselves straight away into the situation. And then I shot one, I thought, I need to see her coming to him and her fear when she's in the taxi. So that was actually shot as an extra one morning at 7.15 down the road in London. Um, in a car and hoped, I hoped it would edit together and with the right sounds and would look like it was in a taxi in New York and I, I hope it did. <laughs> it did. Oh, well, let's yeah. go to the audience and see if they have any questions. If anyone would like to go first, do I see any hands? Okay, over here. Question is, I like to hear about the music, it was wonderful. Thank you. Um, well, in the cutting room, finding a relationship with music in a film is always key, and I've always tried to resist the idea of music as a kind of emotional prop for a film, or kind of like wallpaper that just sort of covers it, and that music has to have a function, maybe as a kind of argument even with what you're seeing, or counterpoint, or none at all, or you know, silence is great. No music's great. So the question for me always is, well, okay, what? 
And then um, in this case, I was in so many films, when I, I in the cutting room, I start to hear things. And in this case, the key of A minor. And then I started to think, how can I introduce musically tension that isn't about da 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 da, da you know, <laughs> jaws or whatever, <laughs> but is a tension within itself. And in this case, I decided the tension was between the electric guitar, the singing, mournful electric guitar, and acoustic string, ch sort of chamber sound. And so, um, the musicians I wanted to work with, the people that I know and love, Victoria Malogo, who's an outstanding violinist, and Matthew Barley, cello, incredible. And these are people I've worked with, with before, and Fred Frith I've worked with on guitar or many films. So that's kind of how it started. So I started writing the pieces and bringing them into the cutting room and composed at least five times as many, much music as eventually ended up in the film. Um, and uh, some of it's now on the CD, even including the pieces that aren't in the film. But um, that's how it happened. So I, I composed through the edit. Yeah. Thank you very oh. much. Soundtrack is available now? It's available now. Okay. Yes. Okay. Sony Classical, Milan, whatever. I'm troubled by the ending. Yes. Um, Molly is a very empathetic... I'm not Molly hearing you very well. a very empathetic daughter, caring, trying to do everything. Yes. But she's also in denial. My take is she's also in denial of the gravity of the situation. You know, we just saw the beginning of one day, or two days, or a few days, of I'm sure many days. And you don't, I didn't feel like she was getting it. She needed more help. And by him, by uh, her, Leo saying her name, it was like it was all, uh, my takeaway was it was all okay. Like it was going to get, she thought it was going to get better because he found her. Yeah. With all due respect, I disagree. <laughs> um, but she's she's not in denial. And I think that there's various scenes during the day, like the scene in the underground par car park, where she says, albeit slightly ambiguously, but she says, I don't, you know, she says, I don't understand what you're saying. I'm going to have to, I've lost a big job. I'm going to have to make some hard decisions. Now, I didn't want to fill in the gaps, i.e., you're going to have to move into a care assistive facility. <laughs> but, you know, that's the kind of decision. And what she's been doing is she's been holding for him as long as it possibly can be an independent life with some dignity. This came directly out of my research with my brother who lived alone until he died, but we had carers come in and look after him, like the carer who's in this in this story. Um, and the, I talked a lot with nurses and others whose job, they dedicate themselves to this issue of what do they call calculated risk. The risk of somebody continuing to live alone, what's gonna happen? They can, might go out in the street and get lost, or they might turn the gas on and, and you know, the place might catch fire or whatever, but versus the risk of they go into a facility, they lose everything they know, they're totally disoriented because they're not living in a familiar environment, they lose uh, control of everything, they really do start to live the life of a vegetable. You know, that's another kind of risk. So how do you, cal you calculate that risk? And there's no really safe option. And I think the denial that's much more dangerous than the, than the denial of, of how difficult somebody is in is the denial that they are any more a human being with rights and, and the right to independ an independent life that maybe doesn't look like a perfect life to everybody, but for that person is their life. So uh, these are all very alive issues, and I talked about them a lot with Al and with Javier. And what we're seeing is the day in which she realizes something's going to have to change, that it's got to, this is the day when she sees that. And at the very end, 
she experiences that split. Shall I stay or shall I go? Can I have a life or is my life going to be subsumed to living, looking after him? And that's why we see her at the end become two, which of course is a reflection of the fact that he is at least three, which is, by the way, an indication of the fact that we're all at least 20. You know, we, we are all a crowd. We are not one person. This is a fake. This is a performance that we accept, the limitation of self, the illusory self, but this is a philosophical digression, but it was at the center of the film. Why do you like the railroad flat? We like that too. Okay. The railroad flat where he lived, why did he like that? He could have lived somewhere else, maybe more opulent or? Well, first of all, when I traveled around in New York on the raised subway and looked into those windows like like two meters from the edge of the train. I thought, who is living there? You know, uh, first of all, well, I think somebody like Leo is living there, point one. Point two, the train, the train that's going somewhere, the sense of movement, the hypnotic feeling of other lives that are passing the windows, you can look in and see them go, all of that mystery. There's an appeal, um, but that was it. It was somebody who's living in a place that other people might consider unappealing, but he would have his reasons for feeling that they were like the railroad to somewhere. Okay. Mm -hmm. Over here. Did people hear that? Yep. Yeah, she was talking about the the uh, the role of hope when there's signs, but she was also talking about the fact that people do get treated as if they can't speak for themselves and treated less than. It's the the curse of every person with a, with a, who has a disability, the way that they're not seen as a as a whole human being, and the I think that's what you were saying, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, you, you also bring up in the film the aspect of uh, immigration and how he's been here for many years, what, 30 years, and it's still like, get get out of here, you know, get that Mexican out of here, he took my dog. Again, it's someone who's not, he's just treated as, as you know, he doesn't belong here. So it was interesting that you raised that issue, which is so contemporary now as well. What I wanted to do was draw a parallel between somebody who is in as Susan Sontag put it, the kingdom of the sick. There's the kingdom of the sick and the kingdom of the well. And there's a kind of border <laughs> that you have to cr you cross when you go from one, from one to the other. Um, but we're living in a very border-aware times <laughs> where physical borders, walls, r the rise of nationalism everywhere and populism and so on have become like, in a way, metaphors for, for interior borders as well that we need to cross. So I thought for him, once Javier had decided to play the part and given that he is Spanish speaking, that it would make sense in the American setting for him to be Spanish speaking, well, in this case from Mexico, with a second generation daughter who had, in a way, crossed the border. Um, and um, and work with that as a, not as a, the foregrounded theme, but as an additional layer of otherness uh, and, and the experience of right. not fitting in, not not knowing where home is anymore. Which, of course, with any for anyone de with dementia, can become a very difficult theme. I want to go home. Where, where's my home? You know. You know. You, you mentioned early on about. You know, I asked you if this was a more personal film, and you said they're all personal and I guess I want to ask you if if going through your movies that they're personal and in, in that you had to make them at that time like for example I don't know if you could make Orlando now because maybe you're in another place than you were in 1992 so if you can maybe tell us about some of the films and why maybe they're personal to you or more personal than, than well others? I think that if if you're f any filmmaker has to feel first of all possessed by the need to make the film because it's so damn hard 
and it takes so long. It, if you're a writer director, it takes even longer because it's the writing that's the really slow, long bit that everything else is, is the heavy lifting that everything else is based on. And post-production, you know, you have this little sprint called a shoot in the middle that is really fast, but everything else is slow. And you, you have to ha therefore be working with something that is going to sustain your interest, your passion, and give you the stamina, the necessary stamina to keep going. Um, it's, you know, we're talking a three or four year process per film. So that's quite a long time. So therefore, choosing a subject that is going to withstand the fact that you're going to hate it at times, you're going to be bored with it, you're going to think it's pointless, why am I doing this, you know, and all that stuff. It's got to carry you through the, the inherent necessary doubts and so on. Um, and so it needs to have it needs to have a personal meaning, and that's kind of the criteria that I use for that very difficult stage of w of deciding what I'm going to do next mm -hmm. before jumping. Mm -hmm. And um, I usually work on several things in parallel. I have you know literally three like three scripts on the desk. And I move from one to the other and then to the other. And I'm thinking, oh, is it going to be this one? And then in the end, it's like it suddenly comes together either because the casting's OK or somebody wants to put some money into it or something. So the decision finally can be, to a degree, taken out of my hands. But the uh, that's what I'm saying. Per the personal is, a, is it almost like the wrong word. It's like. It has to be necessary. It has to be, I will expire if I don't make this film. Mm. I'm going to actually burst or <laughs> die. So there has to be that kind of pressure behind it. And in this case, the pressure was twofold. One was, I've lived, I want to honor my brother. I want to put something out in the world that even if it does is small, says people with this condition or living with this condition are fully, fully human. And I, I honestly don't know if I've succeeded, but um, that was my intention. Mm. Um, but combined with things that I've been wrestling with for decades philosophically about what does what is this frame of the cinema that I've devoted decades of my life to? What is this portal that we're kind of looking through? You know, Is it or isn't it a, a model for the mind, you know, the, this thing that we all are living inside of and don't fully understand and sometimes look at or try and meditate through or with or whatever, this illusory, mercurial, enormous kind of universe of untapped brain cells and consciousness and so on. You know, is this medium, this hour and a half thing, more or less, of cinema, is that the medium that we can explore these unexplorable possible realities that we each live within and the complexity of that? So. <laughs> if you like, I kind of sort of brought those ongoing right. preoccupations together with this specific situation. Well, I'm going to ask you now what's on the top of your pile for next. I've written a political comedy. Um, I think, you know, like enough crying already is <laughs> my feeling after doing this film. <laughs> and the previous film I did, The Party, was a comedy. And I have to tell you, sitting in a big cinema and hearing people laugh and knowing that it's so good for all of us to laugh. Right. I mean, you know, make them laugh, make them cry. You know, the crying has its place too. And tragedy is, listen, this is a tragedy, this film in a way. But it's a tragic illness. And we all suffer. And look what's happening right now with illness in the world. Mm. We're all facing our mortality. And, you know, oh, it's not really happening. Or, or it is, or isn't it? You know, there's a lot of mystery about illness. But what, one thing for sure is illness makes us face the fact of mortality. Right. So. Well, I love your films because they make us think. So thank you so much for, for coming. You. and. The, the movie opens on Friday. 
So please tell all your friends, it's very important. Thank you so much. Thank you.